Help. Welcome to our webinar, How to Perform Predictive Analysis on your Web Analytics Tool Data. It's our very pleasure to have you with us here today and help you to understand how we can take your analysis to the next level. Before we start this meeting, I'd like you to, to note a few things. Your mics need to be muted. Not only muted in GoToWebinar 2, but also make sure that you do it through your computer settings. Please make sure that you can listen to us properly and that you can view our screen be shared with you. Please have in mind that we are going to share this webinar recording, PPT and all the useful links that you're going to need to, to have in order to perform your predictive analysis. Whenever you have a question or a query, please let us know through the chat. It will be our pleasure to help you. After we end this online meeting, you're going to be directly routed to our webinar survey. Please don't miss answering to it. It's extremely important for us to have your honest feedback so that we can keep improving our next webinars and interactions with you. Today we're going to have here with us myself, Carolina Raripi. I lead inbound marketing activities here at Catholic and I'm going to be your hostess today. We also want to have Amal Gandalia, who is our data model engineer, and he's going to show us how we can build a predictive model and perform our predictive analysis. We also want to have Kushan Shah with us, who is a web analyst, and he's going to give us an introduction of R and also going to show how we can use R to give, to build better plots and get and get better insights from our data analysis. So. Before we start, we start talking about predictive analysis, I'd like to call Amar Dalia here to give us a, a direct background and explain us all the disciplines of analytics that are out there available for us. So, hi Amar, thank you very much for joining us today. Can you please give us a briefing of all the, the disciplines of analytics that are, that are out there? Uh, sure, Carol. Let me talk about the three disciplines of analytics and uh, that we generally use for our requirements. And uh, these are uh, descriptive analytics, uh, prescriptive analytics and uh, predictive analytics. Descriptive analytics focuses on what has happened. A standard reporting based on collected data is one of the classic examples of a descriptive analytics. Moving to the prescriptive analytics, this discipline of analytics anticipates that what will happen, when will it happen, and why will it happen. Let's take an example of oil and gas exploration, where a prescriptive analytics software tells you that uh, where to drill, how to drill, and how to minimize environmental impact. Finally, talking about predictive analytics, uh, this area of analytics helps you to predict the outcome based on a predictive model using machine learning and uh, statistical techniques. Since our focus is on uh, predictive analytics, let me, let me talk more about the predictive analytics. Many practitioners define uh, predictive analytics differently, but Eric Siegel, one of the thought leaders in this domain, defines predictive analytics as technology that learns from the experience to predict the future behavior of individuals in order to arrive better decisions. In a nutshell, uh, predictive analytics is that discipline which helps you to see in future. Okay, Amar, thank you very much for giving us this briefing and also for telling us a bit more about predictive analytics. But for a web analyst to perform a predictive analysis, what does this, this person needs to perform before building the predictive model? What are the steps that we need to take in order to be able to have to perform the predictive analysis? Can you please tell us a bit more about it? Definitely, Carol. I will try to answer your question using an analogy. To perform the predictive analytics, we need three basic things, and these are tool, data, and model. Tool is like your vehicle, data is like your passenger, and model is like your route that you select to reach your destination. So in our case, tools that we can use to perform the predictive analytics includes SAS, SPSS, MATLAB, and R. But uh, we'll be demonstrating R during this webinar. Once we have tool with us, we need appropriate data. In, uh, in our business problem, we will be using uh, Google Analytics data. 
And finally, we need an appropriate model or methodology to perform uh, predictive analytics or get analytics done. So in our case, we'll be using machine learning uh, algorithm based on logistic regression. Okay, Amar, thank you very much for telling us about these three steps that we need to take. So from now on, I'd like to adopt this slide as the outline of this webinar. After receiving all of this, of your suggestions for this webinar content, we have this, decided to separate the content into two parts. First, we're going to talk about predict predictive analytics. So we're going to be addressing the two, which is R. We're going to explain you how to extract your Google Analytics data into R. And after that, how you can build your predictive model and perform a predictive analysis. As a second part of this webinar, we are going to explain you how you can use R to build, to build best, the best plots and get the best insights from your visualization, okay? So, to get started with the predictive analytics part, I'd like to call Kushan to give us an introduction of R. So, hi Kushan, thank you very much for being here with us today. Can you please explain us a bit more about R, what is this tool, how we, what kinds of applications we can have from that, and why we, do you, we should use this tool to perform our predictive anal analysis? Sure, Carol. Uh, hello, everyone. Now, let us have a brief overview about R and its various applications. So, R is a statistical uh, computing language, which by nature it is open source and it has been widely used by organizations to solve their uh, business problems. For many years, the variety of applications that have been possible with R have made it a very popular language indeed. So R can be used for data analysis, statistical uh, testing, forecasting, data visualization, and predictive modeling. Uh, I would like to tell you that predictive modeling is the focus of this webinar and Amar will be explaining you how to build predictive models uh, in a very short time and data visualization uh, we will be covering at the end of this webinar. So Carol, this was the introduction to R. Okay, so think now that we know what is R and how we can use it, can you please explain us why have we adopted R as a tool for this webinar? What are the advantages that R provides us? Sure, sure. So uh, one of the main advantages of, of R is that it is very, very easy to integrate with a variety of data sources. So even if your data resides in an, uh, in an SQL database or let us say in a spreadsheet or behind an API, it can be very easily imported to R. One of the key features uh, that differentiates R from other programming languages is that R has this neat concept of a data frame, uh, which is similar to a two-dimensional uh, table, wherein you can get your data and then uh, manipulate it. Moreover, R has a, a very exciting set of uh, packages. So over the year, uh, years, a lot of developers, while working on R, have uh, for for their own applications, they came up with their own codes and which extended the basic functionality of R. So these uh, functionalities uh, are called R packages. So these were uh, the couple of advantages uh, which have made uh, this tool very, very popular among the an analytics community. Okay, and now that I believe that our audience may be convinced to use R, what can you tell them? Like, what are the steps that they need to do in order to get started with R? What do they need to do from now on? Yes, uh, so to get started with R, so to get sorry, uh, so to get started with R, we simply need to download uh, and install R suit R uh, from the uh, CRAN website. Uh, the link to the website will be provided to you. And uh, moreover, just getting and installing R is doesn't solve the problem. Since R doesn't come with a very natively intuitive uh, GUI, uh, it'd be helpful if we can uh, download a user-friendly GUI. So a couple of folks at R Studio have developed a very fantastic uh, GUI that helps us reduce the learning curve. So uh, there are a couple of other GUIs too, but R Studio is one of the uh, very widely used GUIs. And during the course of the webinar, uh, we'll be using R Studio uh, for our analysis. Uh, so let us uh, take a plunge and uh, see how R Studio looks. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is the screen that you will be present. You would be presented it with uh, once you install uh, R Studio. 
So as you can see, the screen is divided into uh, four sections, four key sections. And uh, the place where my cursor is blinking is where we would be typing our uh, script. So uh, let us say uh, I just, out of the top of my head, I want to just multiply two numbers. And pressing Control Enter will get uh, the command executed. And as you can see, uh, the result of the key command is displayed into the console. Uh, moreover, taking this further, if I have a variable and I want to store a certain value in t inside that variable, then I execute this command a is equals 5. And as you can see, uh, the variable gets displayed into the workspace. So uh, apart from that, this particular section contains uh, the help. Uh, uh, more of the uh, majority of the R packages are really very well documented. So uh, help can be accessed from this. And we just talked about uh, packages inside R. So uh, this packages tab displays the list of installed packages into your particular uh, workstation. So these packages are the default modules which come uh, with the base R installation. So as we discussed earlier, R comes with a couple of uh, preloaded packages. Uh, but these, since a lot of developers have developed uh, a uh, huge number of packages and they might turn into the order of 4000. So these ca packages have been categorized into uh, certain types, uh, some of which are displayed on this slide. Uh, so you might have packages for uh, data extraction, data visualization, uh, time series analysis, and uh, creative modeling or machine learning. Uh, and now for the purpose of this webinar, we'll be focusing on our Google Analytics, which is the uh, primary package used to extract data uh, Google or rather Google Analytics data into the R interface and uh, moreover for the visualization uh, section we will be using the ggplot2 or the grammar of graphics interface which can help us uh, visualize our data in a very intuitive manner. So I hope uh, the audience might have gained an insight into the R uh, GUI and the concept of R packages. Over to you Carol. Okay, Krishan, thank you very much for this introduction. It was very good. So, but before we move on and we see how we can extract Google Analytics data into R, I'd like to give a very special thanks to Michael Freeman and Nick Mihalovsky from Google. They have worked along with Morgan Dell and Vignesh Prajapati from our team to work to build the R Google Analytics package, which um, allows us to extract Google Analytics data into R. Also, a very special thanks to Hazel Wickham, who nowadays also works with our studio team. He has built a DigiPlot 2 package that allows us to explore, to build better plots and charts through R. Okay? So, now that we have seen the introduction of R, let's move on and see how we can extract Google Analytics data into R. And for that, I'd like to, to ask you, Kushan, to keep, to stay here with us and give us and explain us how we can do that. Sure, sure. So, uh, as we said earlier, Google Analytics uh, is a package which uh, helps us get extract our Google Analytics data into the R interface. So, uh, getting our data is a, a very simple process. Uh, let us say you are this user performing data extraction and your data resides in an anal uh, behind the analytics API. Then uh, we start with, uh, we start accessing the API uh, uh, before we start, or rather before we start accessing the API, we need to authenticate our account and this is done by uh, sending an access token request uh, to this particular uh, OAuth2 server in this case. In return, the server uh, sends us a response and once uh, that successfully com initiates or completes the authorization uh, aspect and uh, once that is done, uh, we can uh, query our profile uh, and with uh, respect to different dimensions and metrics and uh, get our data into R uh, very, very easily. So it would be of much help to see how this can be actually done with the help of R Studio. So let us quickly jump to the uh, R Studio interface. So I'll quickly clean up this section. Okay. So as we, as we uh, saw earlier, uh, many of the packages in R are very, very well documented. And this is also the case with the R Google Analytics package. So uh, in the list of packages, once you install it, 
Uh, we'll be providing the uh, link uh, to download and install the Google Analytics package at the uh, end of this webinar. So once you install this package, it gets displayed into the, uh, the packages uh, list. And uh, clicking on it shows us the various functions available with uh, inside the package. So we click on the uh, core function, the R Google Analytics. And why we did was it contains an example script uh, which you can easily use and modify for your own purposes. So, okay, we'll be using the script uh, for extracting data uh, from a particular uh, Google Analytics account. And you can simply copy the script to the to uh, the script section and start playing around with it. Uh, so the first step is obviously we need to uh, load the library, which brings the library into memory. Uh, this can be done using uh, the library command. And as we saw in the graphic earlier, we need uh, before we build the query, we need to authenticate our account. Uh, this is done with the help of uh, query dollar authorize function. So we, when we execute that, we'll be taken to the browser interface, and it asks us whether we want to provide access uh, to the OAuth interface using the OAuth interface. Rather, we click on accept and. Okay, so in the next step, uh, we'll be exchanging uh, a code with the OAuth2 server. And in response, it sends us another access token, which we need to copy and paste it inside the R console. Once that is done, our account is very much authenticated. And we need to create an uh, Google Analytics API object that will actually f help us fetch the data from the API. So as you can see, once we, uh, as soon as we run these commands, uh, various variables get populated inside the workspace. And, and uh, this is the core interface. Uh, so uh, what's interesting is, uh, in order to get some data, uh, get Google Analytics data from the API, we need to provide a date range, which in this case is provided with the help of start date and end date. Moreover, uh, we need to uh, list out the dimensions and metrics for which we would like to extract data. So uh, in the case of R, or in the case of R Google Analytics, these dimensions and metrics names are to be prefixed with GA colon. So uh, I am now currently extracting data for the dimensions month, uh, visitor type, and visits. And we run this command. Next, we will be calling the API with this query so that it fetches data okay, very quick. So as you can see, it matched uh, 12 results, and this was stored into uh, this particular data frame. So we'll quickly have a look at, OK. So I'll just elongate the screen. OK. So we can see that uh, for the dimensions and metrics that we selected, we have data for month, visitor type, and visits. And I, in the later part of the webinar, uh, we'll be focusing on how we can manipulate this data and use it to build a basic visualization. So that's all for the uh, data extraction part. OK, Kushan, thank you very much for showing us how we can extract Google Analytics data into R. This is really useful. So now that we, we have uh, been introduced to the tool, and now have, that we know how to extract GA data into R, let's move on and see how we can build uh, the predicted model. And for that, I'd like to call Omar here, who will show us how to perform this predictive analysis. So hi, Omar. Thanks for being here with us. Can you come back and explain us how we can uh, view the predictive model using logistic regression, please? Uh, sure, Karal. Uh, but before jumping to the actual model, it would be helpful to provide some background. So this slide shows the projected growth of uh, retail e-commerce in the uh, US. Uh, e-commerce business is uh, increasing at the rate 5 to 10 percent every year, and this growth is expected to rise. But one of the problem every e-commerce retailer is facing is the problem of uh, product return. Uh, to get an idea about how serious this problem is, let's have a look at some facts. A famous article from a Time Magazine column states that for every $1 spent on merchandise, 9 cents are written. 
and uh, product return have kept on rising along with the growth in e-commerce industry. Average return rate for e-commerce retailers varies from anywhere 3% to 12%. If you can reduce this return rate even by a marginal amount, then it would have a substantial impact on the revenue. So let's take an example here, example scenario. An e-commerce store selling uh, female apparel has a return rate 9%. If you can reduce this return rate to 7%, then how much it would impact on the revenue? So in the case of 9% return rate uh, for this e-commerce store and with the average order value of $100 and 500 orders per day, total income for this e-commerce store is uh, $50,000 and loss due to the return is $4,500 leading the revenue post loss $45,500. If you can reduce this 9% return rate uh, by 2% means making it to 7% then with the same same parameter of average order values and orders per day a loss due to the returns comes out to be $3,500 and increases revenue by $1,000 per day. So if we, if we can calculate this increased revenue uh, due to the record return in a long run then for a one month we can uh, increase our business by $30,000 and for a one year we can increase our uh, business by $365,000. Uh, isn't it a valuable proposition? Would you agree, Carol? Absolutely, Amar. Okay, so now we understood how serious this problem is. The question arises that how we can solve this problem? So we'll solve this problem uh, using machine learning algorithm and use Google Analytics data. So because we are interested into knowing that in which transactions or a list of transactions the probability of return is higher so we will use the transactional, transactional data from Google Analytics. We can categorize these uh, transactional data in a pre-purchase data and uh, in-purchase data. Uh, let me talk about the pre-purchase data and in-purchase data. Uh, attributes uh, that get, that captures the behavior of customers until he, he or she adds the product to the carts are uh, my pre-purchase data and uh, once the products are added to the cart then uh, customers initiate sequence of steps and lands on thank you page. The attributes uh, captured during these activities are my in-purchase data. I will talk more about this uh, pre-purchase data and in-purchase data in uh, modeling process. So since, since now we have understood the uh, background of the problem, uh, let me move ahead and uh, tell about the uh, actual modeling process. So these are the steps of uh, modeling. First we will load the input data set. Uh, uh, in, uh, in our case we will load the uh, train data set from CSV file in R and then uh, in the ne uh, next step we will introduce the model variable where we will identify the response variable and the predictor variable uh, and then we create the actual model using machine learning technique and uh, in the next part we will uh, check the model performance where we will calculate the accuracy of the model and uh, finally we will apply the model to the test data set. So these are the steps of uh, modeling but let me take a while here. Let me talk about the machine learning technique that we are going to use. So we are going to use uh, supervised learning method. So let me talk about the supervised learning method. What is supervised learning method and how it works? So supervised learning algorithm generates a function that maps uh, input or label data to desired output. To understand supervised learning method, uh, let me take one example. Take a spam detection problem. How, the, how does Gmail spam, spam detection system works? First, uh, training data containing the list of emails in the, uh, identified as a spam and non-spam in the form of a label are fed into the algorithms through the variables. The algorithms learn the logic and create the predictive model. Now, the new test data set or a sample data set containing the list of emails is fed to the model. Uh, where the task of this uh, predictive model is to identify or predict uh, whether given email is spam or not spam. In our case, we are interested into uh, predicting uh, or uh, identifying that uh, 
whether the product will return or not. So this is very similar to this farm detection problem. So let me go to the first step of uh, modeling process which is about uh, loading the input data. So let me go to the R studio. However, my data set are in a CSV file which is in train.csv. Loading it into R is uh, very simple. I will use uh, read.csv function. Let me type it here. Uh, whatever I am typing here are just uh, variables and functions of the R. So you don't need to worry about that. We will provide very easy reference material after this webinar. So let me execute this command by pressing control and enter. As you can see in the workspace that uh, data frame called train is loaded. Uh, we can view this data frame by clicking on it. So this is my data set which, which contains the several variables. So I have loaded the train data set uh, successfully. And we finished with the first step of the modeling process which is about loading the input data. Let me go to the second step which is about uh, introducing the model variables. Uh, let me talk here about the feature engineering uh, which is the part of uh, modeling process. Uh, feature engineering uh, is a process of augmenting new variables uh, based on available variables. Means we have some variables are there in uh, our data sets. We can create other variables uh, based on that variables. Uh, feature engineering depends on the domain knowledge that that problem you are solving. So let me take an example here to understand how feature engineering, how we can do fe create features or uh, do feature engineering. In our case, let me say that a product purchase as a gift are uh, less likely to be written. So we can create the new variable which represents that whether the product is purchased as a gift or not. If product is purchased as gift, then uh, uh, the re variable represents one and uh, otherwise it is zero. Let me take uh, other example here also. Uh, product purchased in holiday seasons are more, more likely to be written. So we can create another variable that which represents that whether the transaction has occurred in uh, holiday season or not. So let me go to the R studio and uh, give the uh, introduc uh, information about the variables as I discussed that uh, the second step is about uh, introducing the variable. So as you can see that uh, there are many variables starting from transaction ID, visitor type, visit length, medium, city. Uh, these are my general attributes means uh, because we have uh, transactional data. So it contains uh, general behavior or a general attributes of visitor. And uh, yes, as, as I talked uh, just yet about the feature engineering where we, we, I introduce about the new variable. So I have actually created, created it in my uh, data set. As you can see that uh, is holiday represents the uh, whether the pro, uh, transaction occurred in uh, holiday season or not. It, it is created actually from the month variable because uh, November, December month is uh, considered as a uh, holiday season. So I have created the variable based on that. And also there is uh, another variable which is, uh, is gift which uh, represents that whether the product is purchased in, the, in this particular transaction as gift or not. So these are my these, uh, new variables. And I have also talked about the pre-purchase data and in-purchase data earlier. So let me talk about here uh, which, which are the variables are my pre-purchase data and uh, which are the variables are my in-purchase data. So this uh, variable called uh, C-min price represents uh, a minimum price of product user has clicked on. Similarly, a max, a C max price. So these are my pre-purchase data means uh, I have collected during the uh, uh, 
purchase activity and uh, another uh, variable uh, beam in price and beam in uh, max price beam in price represents that uh, minimum price of product in a shopping cart so this is my in purchase data similarly beam max price and uh, finally we have uh, one uh, variable called label which indicates that the, whether the product has returned or not in that particular transaction. Uh, these are my uh, past data sets. So I have the information of uh, all this, all that, tran all those transactions that uh, whether the product has written in that particular transaction or not. So this was the uh, my variables. But before we create actual model, we need to tell uh, model that uh, which variable is to be predicted. So here comes the concept of uh, response variable and uh, predictor variable. Uh, let me take uh, an example so I can uh, easily explain the, what is the response variable and what is the predict predictor variable. Uh, you might very well know that the size of the, uh, price of the house is dependent on the size of the house. As the size of the house is bigger, price of the house will be high. So if, if, you want, if you want to estimate the price of the house based on size of the house, then uh, price of the house will become your response variable or uh, dependent variable and the size of the house will become your uh, independent variable or a predictor variable. So in our case, we are interested into predicting this label. So this will become my uh, response, variable, response variable and the rest of the other variables will become my uh, predictor variables. Here uh, I want to tell you that uh, I will not use the transaction ID during the mo uh, model creation process. So uh, I need to remove it. So let me do it first. I will use uh, this command or uh, this is, uh, I want to uh, remove the first variable, so I am giving just here minus 1. So it will remove my uh, first variable, which is the transaction ID. Let me execute it. By clicking on the data frame again, you can see that uh, uh, transaction ID is not present here. So I have removed it and I will not use that uh, variable during the model, uh, model creation process. So now we have done with the second step of the modeling. We identified the response variable and the predictor variable also. Let us move ahead and go to the third step of uh, modeling which is uh, about model creation. Here I will use a machine learning algorithm as I talked earlier I will use a logistic regression. So let me do that in R. I will use the GLM function to create the model. Uh, GLM stands for a generalized linear model and as I talked earlier uh, to create the logic uh, to create the model using logistic regression I need to use uh, GLM function so I can uh, create it. Uh, but this, uh, this uh, GLM function contains several arguments so let us look let us have a look at the argument first. Uh, what the arguments we need to pass uh, when we create the model. So to, to create the model using the GLM function, we need to give three arguments in this function, which is the family, uh, formula, family and data. Let me discuss it uh, one by one. Uh, form, formula, in the formula, we set the response variable and the predictor variable separated by tilde sign. Then we set the family equal to binomial. Since, uh, since my output variable or uh, my outcome label is in the form of uh, 0 or 1, means it is, it is a binary value. So I will use the bin uh, binomial family. And uh, finally, finally, I will uh, set the train data set as a reference to the argument data. So data equal to the train. Let me set these arguments uh, in a GLM function in RStudio. So first argument was uh, formula in which uh, I will, I'm going to give a response variable. I can uh, access the variables by uh, dollar sign after the name of the data frame, which in our case it is a trend. So 
variable label is my response variable as I discussed earlier which is in this data frame at the last and then till sign dot here I have set dot which means that I'm going to use all the predictor variables uh, from the train data set otherwise you can specify each variables uh, separated by plus sign also set the second argument which is uh, family equal to binomial and last data equal to train because my data set is in the data frame train so now we have a GLM function is ready I will store the outcome of this GLM function in a variable called model a model will contain all the parameters generated by a GLM function so let me execute this command as you can see the red symbol in the workspace which uh, indicates that uh, my execution is in process this will take uh, 40 to 50 seconds to finish once it finishes uh, my model will be created and all the parameters will be set in uh, variable model so let us wait for uh, that and uh, until it finishes okay so now we have uh, executed this command and uh, created the model here is one uh, warning message which uh, tells that uh, fitted probabilities are numerically in the 0 and 1 because uh, my uh, response variable is uh, in the form of 0 and 1 so it is giving the warning that all the probabilities are 0 and 1 here I can say that 0 indicates that 0 percent probability and uh, 1 indicates 100 percent probability so this is just warning we don't, know, we don't need to worry about that so now we have uh, done with the model creation let's move to the next step which is about um, checking the model performance uh, here I will apply the model on uh, train data itself so to check that how efficiently model can predict on train data itself so let me do that in R uh, I will use these uh, four lines of uh, code to calculate the accuracy let me talk uh, about all these four lines in a very short uh, so uh, in the first line first line I am uh, going to use uh, uh, predict function in which I'm passing the argument model and the new data equal to train because I'm wanting to predict for the train data and uh, the outcome of this uh, predict function is in the form of uh, probabilities so I will uh, round the, all the probabilities using this uh, round function so I will get the uh, prediction in the form of 0 and 1 only and I will store this uh, prediction in a variable called predicted in the second variable uh, which is called uh, actual in which I will store the actual label from the train data set which is in in my data set and then I will uh, create the confusion matrix uh, confu uh, con confusion matrix is nothing but uh, it is uh, it contains the information of uh, actual and uh, predicted classes so I will use uh, predicted and actual variables to create the confusion matrix using F table function and and then I will calculate the accuracy using this uh, formula and uh, will use the confusion matrix so let me execute all for all these four lines let me execute this uh, accuracy so as you can see that uh, model accuracy is uh, 89 percent which is good for us so now we have a good model with us with uh, good accuracy so 
now we, we can use this model for the new data set. So let's move ahead and uh, the final step is applying this uh, model to the test data set. So as of now, uh, let me recall that uh, diagram of uh, supervised learning where uh, we, we uh, discussed about the process of uh, how supervised learning works. Until now, we have done with these steps uh, by uh, loading the training, dat training data sets and uh, introduce the variable also and uh, uh, use the machine learning algorithms, uh, which is the logistic regression, and uh, build the model. So now we are at this stage, and uh, we will use the test data set to uh, uh, or fed to the model and uh, identify the transactions having higher probability. So let me go to the R and uh, load the test data set. Uh, my test data set is the uh, same in uh, CSV format. So I will use uh, read.csv command as I earlier, earlier uh, used in uh, train data set. So let me do it. So let's execute this line. As you can see that in the workspace, uh, there are 425 observations in this uh, data, in test data. Let me view it. A test data set contains the same information as in a uh, trend data set, but here we don't have a uh, label because we want to predict that. So I will use the uh, model to predict the label for uh, all the transactions in the train, uh, test data set. So I will use the predict function. As I earlier used the predict function for the checking the accuracy for the train data set, here I am again using this predict function in which I am giving the model as the argument which I have created and the new data set is equal to test because I want to predict for the test data set or for the transactions in the test data set. The outcome of this predict function is in the form of probabilities. So, uh, for each transaction in a test data set, I will have the probabilities of uh, a product return for, the, for that particular transactions. Uh, so, I will store these probabilities in a variable called test underscore predict. So, let me execute it. So, now I have a stored the probabilities in the test underscore predict variable. But uh, here I am interested into knowing uh, which transactions uh, have the higher probability of return. So I need to subset this uh, variable and uh, identify the transactions having the higher probabilities. So let me do it very quickly. I will use this command here. I am. Uh, setting some constraint that I, I need only the all, all that transaction which have a probability greater than 0 0.6 or let's say 60 uh, percent. I will store all, all the probabilities uh, in the new variable which is uh, higher probe trans. So in this variable, uh, I will, uh, sorry, I have misspelled it. So let me execute uh, this command and uh, separate the uh, uh, transactions having the probability greater than 0 0.6. So as you can see in the workspace, uh, uh, variable created higher underscore prop dot uh, trans which contains the, all the transactions having the probability greater than uh, 0 
So there are 30 transactions out of 425 transactions which have the probabilities of return greater than 60%. So now let me summarize here what we can do if I identified the transaction having the probabilities greater than 0 0.6. So as you can see that in the 30 transactions we have a probability of return greater than 60 percent and uh, in the rest of the other transactions uh, we have a probability less than 60 percent. So I need to look at this uh, higher probabilities of returns, uh, transactions having the higher probabilities. So what we can do now? So we can take uh, some of action. As a basic step uh, we can call this customer uh, before sh shipping the product to verify the purchase. Additionally, we can send uh, discount codes to this set of customer to, in, to incentivize them not to return the product. Moreover, uh, there are many cost-effective ideas that, we can, that can be executed uh, once the identification of higher probability return transaction. So by, by taking this action, uh, we can uh, probably increase uh, our revenue and uh, decrease the return rate. So, so this is how I build the model and uh, predicted for the new test data set. So this was the whole process of modeling. Uh, I hope that you have enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Okay, Amar, thank you very, very much for this example. It was extremely helpful. I believe that now our audience is ready to perform that predictive analysis. So now that we've seen the whole process of predictive analytics, it's time to move on and see how we can use R to view the best charts and plots and get the best, the best insights from our visualization of our data. So for that, I'd like to call Kushan to join us once again. Hi, Kushan. Thanks for joining us again. Can you please uh, you. explain us how we can use R to view this chat, this chart? Sure. Thanks, Carol. Uh, so, until now, uh, you must have been building dashboards in Excel or any other visualization tool. Uh, since we now have understood how to get our Google Analytics data into R, uh, it would be a really cool experiment if we could uh, help use this data to build uh, dashboards using the R uh, ggplot2 package, uh, since, uh, which we talked about earlier. So, uh, this, uh, this is the basic idea behind uh, ggplot2. Uh, in the interest of everyone's time, uh, it would be more helpful if I uh, uh, quickly go through the concepts and uh, help see how we can implement uh, these concepts into uh, building dashboards. Uh, so the idea is that ggplot2 stands for grammar of graphics and as you may very well know, uh, uh, any, gra any uh, sentence is composed of words and since words effectively make up a sentence, uh, we can apply this similar analogy uh, to a graph uh, in which we can say that a graph is composed of three key components, uh, geometric shapes, uh, scales and coordinate systems, and uh, plot annotations. And if we could uh, effectively manipulate each of these three components, we could uh, ideally build a very, very effective graphic that could help us, uh, that would help us deliver very good insights. Uh, so we'll quickly move on to uh, our studio and see how we can uh, actually use these concepts to build up a effective visualization. So I'll quickly clean all the objects in the memory and okay. So now uh, we are ready. Uh, as always, uh, we load the ggplot2 library into memory and I have already extracted the data previously and it resides in these uh, three CSV files. Uh, as Amar explained, read.csv is a function which we would be uh, using to extract or to uh, rather uh, load data into R. So we have three data frames. Uh, one of the first uh, data frames, we'll quickly move on and see that it contains data month in the form of numbers. Each month represents a uh, number like January is one and so on and the transactions occurring across each of these uh, months. So let us plot, let us uh, uh, visualize how the transactions performed uh, according to uh, the different months that we had in the data frame. So ggplot2 is the main function. The data resides in the data frame called ga.data1. We need to specify it. And out of the data frame, we are mapping the month variable to the x-axis and the transactions variable to the y-axis. And 
since we are uh, we intend to see uh, this in the form of a bar graph uh, it is uh, specified by a geom underscore bar where geom repre represents the uh, object that would be actually displaying uh, the data and when we quickly run this and see okay so what we can see here is uh, we performed a small mistake uh, since the months were in the form months were in the form of numbers uh, are understood it as a quantitative variable and it displayed it incorrectly uh, so in order to avoid this uh, there is a small uh, data cleaning step that is uh, required and it requires us to convert tell r that okay consider these as individual uh, months and not as a quantitative variable so this is done by the uh, as dot factor and now if we rerun the same command it r will understand that our uh, months are to be displayed individually so each and every month has uh, a different uh, value so as you can see from this graph uh, it effectively jumps out the conclusion that uh, effectively jumps out is that transactions have peaked in the month of uh, december and uh, moving this argument forward we would like to know the uh, medium through which uh, the transactions have peaked in the month of uh, uh, december uh, so we do the same thing and i have extracted data for an additional dimension uh, medium and stored it into this data frame uh, named ga dot data 2 so we're doing the same as dot factor step uh, as i mentioned and as you can see uh, i changed the name of the uh, data frame it now is uh, ga dot data 2 same x and y and just the uh, small change which i did is i want to face it uh, the entire graph by with respect to this variable called medium and when we run this we see how effective and easy it is easy it becomes rather to compare transactions across medium so as you can see uh, the peak in the transactions was usually the traffic from the uh, organic sources intuitively uh, very helpful and i would again i would like to know that uh, which which set of visitors uh, rather contributed to uh, such an increase uh, did it come from new visitors or uh, did it come from returning visitors and uh, since uh, we have worked on uh, black and white uh, charts until now it would be helpful to add a bit of color and additionally a bit of flavor uh, to this so the visitor type dimension has been stored into uh, this another a new data frame called uh, ga dot data 3 and we have since we already loaded loaded it in the first step we again apply as dot factor okay so uh, what this keyword means uh, it is a, a function in r which tells that uh, we want to effectively see the bars uh, of new and returning visitors stacked uh, in a neighboring position so we are effectively using the position underscore dodge uh, the rest of the command is pretty much the same except uh, this we are getting rid of the uh, gray background and turning it into a black and white and with this you might have gathered that we are adding a plot title okay so mm -hmm. we run this and so this is the resulting graph which uh, tells us the comparison between uh, the transactions of new versus uh, returning visitors and if we concentrate on the organic medium we find that the uh, peak has uh, come primarily due to uh, returning visitors and the same uh, pattern was also found in the month of uh, September so uh, what we did is we mapped a color uh, we mapped an additional dimension that is visitor type to a different color uh, wherein new uh, visitors are represented by the pink and the returning visitors are represented by the uh, blue color rather so we can take this uh, forward and uh, keep on exploring and since uh, visualization is a interactive process and uh, insights uh, come across to us when we keep on exploring with uh, data sets in from the form of different visualizations uh, so this is our ggplot uh, to the ggplot to package rather it helps us to plot uh, intuitive and informative graphs in a, in a very uh, simple manner Okay, Krishan, thank you very, very much for showing us an alternative to view our, our plots. So now, as I said before, it's time to move on and start our question and answer round. And for this round, 
because uh, since we have a time constraint, we have selected only three questions that you sent us. But please have in mind that all the questions that you've sent us, all of them are going to be addressed by our team. And they're going to, they're going to be addressed uh, by email, and also we're going to compile all of them in a unique blog post, okay? So, the first question that we have here is, can you please comment on the reliability of the prediction by the GLM model? Is it possible to know why the model did predict 0 or 1? Uh, Amar, can you please answer this question? Yes, Carol. Uh, yes, uh, uh, this is very initial part of the entire predictive modeling exercise. And it doesn't end here. Uh, what happens is that uh, there are several cycles that we undergo to ensure that uh, different models are applied. Once the uh, different models are run on the same data, their output is uh, compared with the each other. Then we also look at the, some specific type of uh, bias and barriers uh, that was introduced by a different model. Since the webinar is more educa educational in nature, uh, we have kept the scope of uh, only till the model creation. Okay, Amar, thank you very much. So the next question that we have selected is, how would you integrate R and predicted modeling with Omniture Site Catalyst? This was sent from Saroj Patel. Kushan, can you please answer this one? Sure. Uh, as we discussed earlier in the webinar, uh, R has this amazing capability to get integrated with a variety of data sources. Uh, we can use the Omniture API to extract data from Omniture into R. Uh, moreover, you can have your data from the uh, site catalyst to be extracted via data warehouse and get it stored on the server. Uh, this can then be accessed by R very easily and then we can perform predictive modeling on uh, that data set. Uh, there are already some efforts being done at Keystone Solutions who have developed a package called R Site Catalyst. Uh, moreover, you can also download flat file from your web analytics tools and also provide the reference to it for the process of predictive modeling. Okay, Krishan, thank you for answering this one. And the last question that we have selected is the following. Whether our Google Analytics is compatible with R3.0 or not, and it was sent from Shed Polling. Krishan, can you please also answer this one? Uh, sure. Uh, we have contributed the code to uh, version for through version 3.0 to code.google.com and we are waiting for them to uh, create an updated package. Uh, we are hoping that it will happen very, very soon. Uh, generally speaking, the upgrades of other packages will be slower in an open source environment. Uh, so if you use a little older version of R, then you are very, very likely uh, to be in an advantageous uh, position. Okay, Krishan, thank you very, very much. So, guys, as I said before, for this webinar we selected only three questions. But don't worry that we are going to be addressing all of them to you. Okay? So, now we are at the end of our webinar. And if you want to know about our upcoming webinars, feel free to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Because we are all the time sharing with you the upcoming events. Okay? Thank you very, very much for being here with us today. And we sincerely hope that now you can perform a predictive analysis. If you have any question regarding R, the extraction of Google Analytics data into R, or how to build a predictive model, please feel free to reach me or our uh, specialist team. Okay? We really hope to see you in our uh, upcoming webinars. And please don't forget to answer our webinar uh, survey and give us our, your honest feedback. Okay? See you very soon. Thank you for joining us today.